Morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from today. Thank you for joining our weekly live stream about digital transformation. Today's topic that we'd like to discuss is how ERP failures link to poor employee adoption and training. So we're going to talk about the adoption and training sides of change management and digital transformation. So we appreciate you all being here today. Uh, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys. And I'm going to introduce our guest in just one moment. But before I do that, just a couple of logistical housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, this is a weekly live stream that we host at the same time, same place. We stream to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And this podcast actually becomes part of, or, or this live discussion, I should say, becomes part of our weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast. So by being here today, you're, you're part of our live production of that podcast. So thank you for, for joining us here today. Um, secondly, uh, we are going to take audience questions today, as we always do. Um, I have a few questions to get us started, but then we'll we'll turn over to the audience for, for questions you all may have, um, which you can do by dropping your question or comment in the chat on whatever platform you're watching from. We have a consolidated stream in front of us so we can see everything that you're you're chatting um, as we chat as we talk here today. And speaking of chat, if you don't mind just dropping in the chat, where in the world you're joining from today? Uh, what city and country are you joining from, regardless of which platform you're on? I'd love to hear where in the world you're joining from today. We have a global digital transformation community that we love to interact with, and we'd love to see where everyone is from here today. So uh, with me today, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but joining me is Nikki Cortez and Joanne Harrison from Optimum and Onboard ERP, and I'll let them introduce their, the two companies and the two platforms here in a moment. Uh, but we thought we'd have these two guests on here today to talk about how ERP failures link to poor employee adoption and training. So with all that being said, uh, Joanne and Nikki, welcome to the show. And I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Joanne, maybe to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about Optimum as well as Onboard ERP as well. Sure. Thank you for inviting us, Eric. Um, so Nikki and I are both directors at both Optimum, our UK um, ERP training consultancy, and also our USA brand, OnboardERP.com. And we've both been with the business since 1998. Um, so Optimum predominantly is based in the UK, and we've supported more than 700 rollouts of different ERP softwares globally with their adoption and training phase. Um, and we support ERP projects in different ways. Sometimes we support the training end to end. Sometimes we help to build that internal training capability and then take a collaborative approach. So it really does depend um, organization to organization. It's always different. Um, and we've recently launched our new North American brand on board ERP with a small office in Chicago. Um, and typically we, we engage with around three to four North American organizations every year, but on board ERP is hopefully going to give us that um, increased exposure um, into North America. Great. So, so well established in, in Europe or in, in UK in particular, but, but uh, expanding rapidly into other, other parts of the world, uh, particularly in the yeah. US, it sounds like. Absolutely. And the majority of our projects are actually multinationals. So there might be a UK presence, but often they're global, they're quite large organizations. Um, but we sort of felt that North America needed that sort of dot com presence, needed us there um, with the footfall in America. So, yeah, hence on board ERP. Got it. And just to clarify, too, the work you do for training and adoption uh, within the ERP implementations is fairly technology agnostic, right? So you're, you're doing it for all sorts of different platforms, not just one type Correct. of ERP system. Correct. Um, the majority, I mean, there are you know a few favorites, if you like, and that's typically S4HANA, Microsoft, ERP, Oracle, Epicor, Info, IFS. Um, they are the core ones, but then often we get approached for, for tools like ServiceNow or ones that we may not have massive exposure to, but we are system agnostic, um, very similar to third stage. Okay, great. Which is how this whole relationship and conversation started was just that, that shared technology agnostic view of the world. And of course, the love and appreciation for change management, employee adoption and training. Um, so we'll focus on the latter part, obviously, here today with, with employee adoption and training um, to start. So uh, great to have you both here today. And thank you. Thank you for being here. I look forward to the, the conversation. Um, and thank you, by the way, for everyone dropping in the chat uh, where you're from today. Um, just to give a few examples of where people are joining from uh, before I get to my questions here to start. Um, we have people joining from Denver, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia, Raleigh, North Carolina, Bryan, Texas in the U.S., uh, Reed, Germany, Sweden, London, 
India, Ireland. So lots of different countries here. So thank you all for joining from wherever you're joining from today. Um, so just as to start the conversation, and, and again, we'll, we'll turn to employee que or audience questions here in, in a moment. See, I'm already thinking about employees and training and adoption. I can't even help myself uh, by butchering my first question. Um, but my first question then for you is, when you think about why ERP projects fail, oftentimes it traces back to poor training, poor employee adoption, and, and really just a lack of focus on that critical work stream. Um, maybe help us, can you help us unpack that a little bit? Like help us understand how, why is that? I mean, I, I certainly appreciate and uh, agree with the statement or with the question that a major reason why projects fail, fail is because of that lack of focus on employee adoption and training, but maybe help us understand why is that? What are, what are some of the symptoms or the the ways that that unfolds in a, in a failure or a troubled project? Sure, yeah. So I think generally what we see is the overinvestment in technology and the underinvestment in the people side. And I think there seems to be a sort of lack of education generally around the importance of training the wider workforce is often overlooked or, you know, the poor relation to a project. And our role is to try and flip that script. Um, and I think there's often the assumption um, that the partner or the SI will, of course, have training included in the contract. Um, it might be mentioned right at the bottom of the proposal with no detail around how training for the end users will be designed, documented and delivered. Um, so this can then delay the research into training options. And so we often see the goal lines being delayed whilst they figure out their training options too late. So key message there, which we'll talk about later, hopefully, is plan it early, think about it really early. Um, and then you have a result when the system actually goes live with no training. Um, and what you see there is those extended hypercare periods. We're not privy to know how much that costs, but you probably know that, Eric, when you go into those rescue projects. Um, because the result is users are just disengaged, frustrated, they don't know how to operate in the new world. And the general feeling among staff then is that the system doesn't work. And actually it's because they haven't been trained in the system. Um, and the staff are the drivers for change. So you've got, you've got to get them on board early, communicate early, um, and engage and train them properly to sort of see that success coming out at the end. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, it does seem like that training oftentimes is, uh, I don't know if afterthought is the word that, that comes to mind for me, but it, it's more, uh, you know, hey, we're going to train the trainer somewhere down the line and you presumably later, you know, much later in the project, we're going to train your trainers and then your trainers are going to go out and train the, the mass employees on how to use the system. And that's a pretty common approach to your point in the proposal, but it, but it's sort of a footnote, you know, in, in a proposal. And, and it's, I don't think a lot of organizations fully appreciate what that, what that really means in terms of the level of effort that can and should go into a training the trainer approach. And I'm going to come back to this point in just a moment, but whether or not train the trainer is the right approach or the best approach. So hold that thought for a second. Cause I want to come back to that. But um, is, is that sort of what you're saying is that you, you see these sort of, uh, you know, lack of focus early on is it sounds like is what you're saying. There's a lack of focus early in the project as far as planning and really fully unpacking what that training program is going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is a place for, I mean, the train, the trainer doesn't work. And, and like you said, we'll touch on that later. Um, but often what you get is, I don't know, 10 days of generic project team training, which is needed. And that's great for your project team. But actually, if you think they're going to have time to cascade training into the wider workforce later on, um, you know, think again kind of thing, because they're going to be really busy with go live prep and other more important things. So, yeah, it, it's a, a certain mindset that we're trying to change. And I'm not going to say that this is every partner in SI. Some do get it right. Some will say you need to get help. You need to find, you know, trainers or, or get internal trainers. Um, but this is what we're seeing the majority of um, on the marketplace. Yeah. Do you know, uh, do you know why that this is that that uh, vendors have sort of universally adopted that train the trainer approach? Is it because they just aren't trainers by profession and it's just sort of the easiest way to address it without really addressing it? <laughs> is that or, or what do you think it is? Yeah, so I think it's there's different perceptions of what train the trainer actually is. And for our SIs, they are typically um, ensuring that they train out their project team on what is probably at the time a generic build. So those SMEs or super users can have informed conversations with the SI, but 
Apart from that, that's their job done with regards to training. Um, and then it's really the end users, which is the much bigger and wider user community that we really need to look after because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are advocating the system and making sure it's used to, to its optimum. Right, right. Yeah, makes makes total sense. So what are your thoughts then on sort of the pros and cons of that train the trainer approach? It's universally adopted, it seems to be by vendors and system integrators. And I, I agree with that statement. But why? Uh, what are some of the pros and cons of that approach? And what, what should yeah. we be aware of? Sure. So we sort of like talked a little around the SI using the train the trainer model. It's pretty informal and more workshop delivery. However, when you start looking at the end user communities across your organization who are going to be your core users, there are definitely pros and cons for the train the trainer model. Um, a few of the pros, for example, you're upskilling your internal team who can deliver the training not only for go live, but you've got business as usual expertise to roll out that training on a one to one or indeed on a wider scale induction program. Um, ideally, these um, trainers, internal trainers that you are going to upskill um, are selected because of their business knowledge as well as their technical knowledge. Right. So they're giving the end user everything in one training session, both the answers to their business related questions, but also explaining the how to questions. And it's obvious um, it's a reduction on any external training costs that you um, incur. However, we know there is going to be a flip side to that one. So I'll get on to the cons. Um, but it also provides a platform for internal upskilling for users that have joined the project but see their direction going in another, another way. So being part of an ongoing project team to support the build and the life, life cycle of that um, ERP system. But talking about the, the considerations or the cons, as mentioned, it does reduce external costs, but there is a cost internally to you because you're taking away what will be a valuable resource from the coalface and from the business to work on projects and to train. So there is that very fine balancing act. And not all super users or subject matter experts make the best trainers in a classroom. It's a fact. And sometimes they don't even enjoy doing it. So what some of our clients do and work with us to do is they group their subject matter experts or their super users into a training team and then coaches. So you can actually categorize your internal workforce. So you've got that brilliant one on one um, coaching service you can call on. But then for go live and larger audiences, you might collaborate with an external party or a third party training partner. Um, and although scripted, you need to be very careful because you can get, um, I'm not going to call them cowboys, but you can get a number of trainers that think, oh, I'll go off scripted a bit off piste and the danger there is we're introducing um, bad habits and maybe workarounds and not following a process um, correctly all the way through so something a little bit of a risk there depending on the type of super user um, or subject matter expert it is um, and if training has historically been delivered by internal staff members what we found is some organizations reach out to a third party so that your internal staff can see you're taking their education and their internal upskilling um, seriously. And it's not just a case of, oh, um, such and such will be training you from the finance team. Oh, right, okay, so I always get my training internally. It really makes a statement and a mark that you're actually looking out for the, the usage of the system as well as the, the learning and education of internal um, staff. So it's a really key one, actually. Mm. But I suppose the train trainer does have pros and cons. Um, many of our clients adopt a collaborative approach. So if you've got some work streams which are um, fairly complex, um, fairly detailed, and they just, they're just they under-resourced on the project team, give them to us or give them to a third party. And the smaller ones, the self-service elements, the lighter touch ones, they can easily manage internally. So I would say um, that it's never one size fits all. There's always going to be a bespoke training program that will work for your ERP um, initiative and implementation. Yeah, there's great points all around. I mean, I think the the separation or the distinction of training versus coaching that's a really good point that i think that's really well said in terms of you absolutely need those coaches right those people that really do know the business the people that can help answer those sorts of questions but that may or may not be the same person or people they're helping with the with the training itself so i think that's a that's a really good point and then uh, i also like your point about how um it, create, it sends a message to the organization that we're taking this seriously. We're creating a robust training program, not just for your existing employees, but even going forward in the future. You know, that's an asset that you can use as you onboard new employees, or if you go through a merger or acquisition, you've got that sort of um, standard training material that you can use to, you know, scale up pretty fast. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you see, Eric, from, from your side, because you asked the question why partners don't have training as a separate work stream? I mean, you engage with more partners. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, it seems as though it plays to their strengths. You know, by doing train the trainer, it's playing to the SI or the vendor strengths. They know the product really well and they're not good at training or communication. So what better answer than to create a train the trainer mentality where I can play to my strengths. I can teach you to how to use my software off the shelf. I don't have to worry about how I configured the software, or how your business works. That's for you to figure out. Um, so I can see how that sort of off offloading it to the client creates a perception that, yeah, you're addressing change of management and adoption and training, but you're not really, you're just sort of pushing it off to the, to the team that's already overworked and overstaffed and or overtaxed uh, in their efforts. So um, I don't know if that's anyone had this brilliant universal plan years ago, but it seems to be that sort of the, the herd mentality that you see with, with vendors and SIs. Um, yeah. And then you have to take their support contract because of course you can't use the system. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now what about, um, what about limitations of generic, off the shelf, out of the box training materials. I mean, most of these vendors like S4 HANA, you mentioned before Microsoft Dynamics, they've been around for years and they've had time to build up some a pretty good library of standard training materials. What are the limitations? I think this is a really important point because so many organizations, including a lot of our clients, just don't understand or don't fully recognize the fairly severe limitations of that standard off the shelf or out of the box training material or training content, how, what are the limitations of that? Or maybe give us some examples yeah. there. Sure, um, yeah, there are considerable limitations and you are right, some of the um, well-established software houses do have off the shelf training material, but there are limitations and some of those are, they are typically functional in content and instruction. So what that means is it cannot address any of the business specific or business um, context messages to all audiences, it's impossible, right? Because you've got multiple sectors and multiple industries reading and referring to the same content. So it cannot be that specific to that audience. So that leaves the audience a tad disengaged and also asking the question, is this pertinent to me? Is this right for me? For example, if I'm looking at content that shows me how to raise a purchase order uh, to order steel from China, yet I'm in retail or pharma, that's not really going to help me that much. It's, you know, it's going to leave me confused. I need to understand and see and read language that pertinent to my business, my product, my customers, my suppliers, etc. Um, so illustrations and examples, they're all generic. And a significant percentage of a learner's understanding of this is not just by reading explanatory uh, content, it's by looking at screen illustrations. Those screen illustrations, which a lot of our um, online tools do, so Task Recorder, Click Learn, all of those types of automated online tools that are typically sold as the answer to everybody's training problem, reduce your cost by 70%, no additional external costs, they actually take screenshots of empty dialogue boxes. Now, surely you would want a value, a meaningful value or text description or business aligned content, because that's also going to contribute to our learners understanding as to how they would populate those screens. So I suppose I would say that the, the key word for me is it's not business process aligned. Um, it's very generic and it doesn't actually address the bespoke requirements. And more and more now we're actually coming across organizations who unfortunately have spent their training budget or managed their training budget based on the cost of one of these system line tools. So for example, we've come across um, Oracle Guided Learning recently, but also with Task Guides and Enable Now. And it really is sold as being the answer to everything. But we've discovered, for example, with Oracle Guided Learning recently, one of our clients needed seven languages translated. Um, but they've come back and been told that they can probably get French translated and it's 80% accurate. Now, for a client that's actually investing, you know, put a lot of their, their training budget and their, their trust in a tool like that, it needs to give them more than that. And as Eric quite rightly said, we've got a lot of these big software houses, so Oracle for Oracle Fusion and S4 HANA and so on. They have libraries worth of generic content. But again, some of these online solutions are literally they sell role-based training, but that role-based training is basically a whole combination of lots of different process guides that that poor end user who may 
I'm not going to say as 400, show my age there, but maybe you moving from a completely different environment and just reading content on screen, that's not going to cut it. They need a blended approach. They need maybe just that first, get them across that first hurdle and then they can start self-learning um, tools. But it's really, really important that you understand, I would say, that you know what you're buying and you know what you're getting if you are investing in any type of automated learning program. Do your research, do your homework. Yeah. Great point. And, and, you know, another thing you've, you've alluded to in that response, Nikki, is the fact that um, so many of these ERP systems are, are fairly flexible I mean, they can do a lot of different things. And even the simplest workflow, like accounts payable, you mentioned, there isn't really a standard accounts payable process that every organization is using, even for the same product. I mean, even for the same product, you're going to have variations of how that system was configured and, and also how you're going to not only interact with the system, but what are the things that happen outside the technology? Like what are the things that don't relate to that one technology? So often we get myopically focused on S4 HANA, Microsoft D365 or whatever the tool yeah. is that we don't think about, well, what do you do outside the system? Or what other systems are you touching? Do you need to touch to be able to do your job? And yeah. I imagine that's part of the training approach too that you would suggest. Yeah, it's such a valid point, Eric, because um, a lot of um, clients that we work with or, or deal with initially, They'll ask, oh, so you'll only train us in um, Dynamics 365 or just S4 HANA? No, we're, we train in end user solutions. So if our end user touches D365 um, extensions and an external pricing um, or yeah, pricing tool, all of those need to be addressed as part of that end user experience. Otherwise, we're not giving them their true role and how it will be used with that system. So, and that's the difference, I suppose, with um, SI training. It's very much, unless you're starting to look at integrations, it's very much under the bonnet looking at that ERP functionality and its modules. For us, we're looking at what holistically that end user needs and also not what they don't need. In other words, we've probably all been on courses at some stage in our lives where we've just been doing this you know, counting the clouds because the content that's being trained out at that present moment in time is not relevant and then we miss a bit that is. So the idea behind that bespoke training is it's all got to be relevant for the end user and it will encompass any of those third party tools that you mentioned, Eric. Right. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Just to turn to the audience here, some of the audience comments and question. Um, like on LinkedIn says, I'd, I'd speak about S4 HANA. It's true that most material is available for functional people but it lacks off the shelf material for business users, 100% correct. Yeah, so, right. you know, and it's, it, we have a client, actually we have one client that we're working with right now. They're actually implementing S4 HANA. They're about to go live here in, in a couple months. And they, they have been um, asking us like, why, why is it you have to custom create these training materials? These, this software has been around for years. I mean, there's tons of material available and that's, that's, I think the, you know, the disconnect oftentimes is the understanding of, yeah, there's a lot of, to your point, Nikki, there's a lot of materials available, but they're not specific to your business and you're deploying S4 HANA in a very different way than any other organization has. Um, even though they're not doing a ton of customization, it's still tailored, it's, yeah. it's configured differently. They use different third-party systems that bolt onto it, all that stuff, you know, you've got to work through. And those little things aren't so little, you know, when, you, when it comes to adoption and training and back to the original point of why products fail because of this, it's those little things that I don't know how to do in my job that creates sort of a domino breakdown in, our, in the end-to-end -end processes because I don't know how to do one part of the process. No one taught me how to do it or I just don't understand it well. And that ends up leading to a bunch of process breakdowns that can become yeah. pretty material. Yeah, and also in client meetings, the, the dreaded words we hear are, um, oh, it's just uh, off the shelf, or it's just box. out of the box <laughs> functionality. And until they say that, well, the whole world's not using the same chart of accounts for starters. And then there's a whole melee of different areas. Even if it is out of the box with very limited customization, it's still the ERP system used by you, your customers, your suppliers, your product suite, your materials. So it, it still does need to have that bespoke element with regards to training because an off the shelf um, set of training materials doesn't cut it for most ERP implementations. Yeah, and I would I would argue too that the more business value you're trying to get out of your digital transformation or ERP implementation, the more important that employee adoption training is. Because let's just use an example of a multinational organization that's deploying Microsoft D365, and they're using that as an opportunity to standardize business processes and sort of consolidate functions in different locations and move to a shared service model where now you've got consolidated HR, consolidated accounting and finance or whatever. Um, that's, that's not just a software deployment. That's a material 
business transformation. There you're talking about changing people's jobs and how you operate. And so that how do you build that sort of non-technology, but more process and organizational focus into training materials? Have you found that to be an important part of that customization of training? Yeah, it's absolutely critical. And one of the questions we typically ask quite early on is, Does your is it an ERP implementation? Or as you said, is it a business transformation program? Do you have a target operating model exercise ongoing? Does it finish before or after your implementation? Ideally before. But the key thing for us is to work with the subject matter experts to ask a whole series of questions that start with who, what, why, where, how. Um, so in other words, we're, we are supporting and we're there for the end users because they will be sat in front of an ERP solution about to raise their first sales order and say, where do I choose my customer? Why do I choose that product? Where do I adjust or apply the discount? And it's all of those typical questions that we would ask during the development of those training materials. And it's giving the business context behind why the user does it. So many um, standard training materials um, are literally just functional based. But when I pick something up, if I'm being told to press a series of buttons, especially if we're talking numbers here, I want to know why I'm doing that. So you've got to have that context. And also from a business um, rationale, you want to make sure that your end users, even at field level, are making informed, smart decisions and they're selecting the right values. And um, so that's what you're not going to get off the shelf. That's how we capture that business process information as well. And I suppose one of the other things that I would say is we utilize collateral at the outset and the start of your ERP, ERP engagement because you're going to have objectives, mission statements, um, targets that you want to meet. And all of that needs to be encompassed and also packaged up as part of the training program. Your comms messages need to be peppered through the training program as well. So the whole thing needs to be joined up and the same messages are being heard by your end user community right from the get go to the last training session that's delivered or the last piece of self-learning that's completed before you go live. So business process is key. Right. Speaking of business process, how do you, um, where do you recommend that training fits into the sequence of end user training and user acceptance training? Like how, how do you typically see those two best um, interact, those two work streams sort of integrate or intersect? Yeah. That's a really great question. And our clients have different perceptions and takes on it. Um, sometimes they're actually pushed down a certain viewpoint based on where the build is and so on. But ideally, when we come on board, um, we would like to be at the start of the UAT process so they can feed outputs to us. But what we've also been asked by clients to do is develop 60% um, of the training program, develop what is ready, and then the subject matter experts or the super users will take those materials into the UAT uh, window or environment and they'll actually test them see so proof of concept does this work is this okay and they're actually almost testing the training materials um, as they go through UAT and it's also supporting a lot of those business users that you need to pluck out of the business that have not been exposed to the CRP system. They've not had six months history, you know, with their scrums and their various project meetings and comms. So it's really useful to have those materials available for the UAT audience. Um, we also do offer different flavors of UAT training. It depends who's doing the UAT really. Could be a whistle stop tour, um, because what you don't want to do is um, pull people in from the business when they don't actually know why they're there. So you need to tell them the importance of being a tester, what it's about, how they pass and fail, and how they literally execute test scripts, but also giving them that navigation look and feel of the ERP the system they're going to be testing in. So I suppose that was a very long-winded answer, Eric, to your question. I sincerely apologize, but really the, I suppose it's all down to the client, where you're at with UAT and how experienced your test user base is going into UAT. And that's how that, how you then decide what training program is required. That's a great, really well said. I think that's a super important point to elaborate on because um, I think too often people think training's over here. Um, you know, Joanna and Nikki are going to handle the training for me. I might handle the mm -hmm. UAT. I'm going to do that over here. And it, there's oftentimes not that intuition that those are two very related work streams and they should reinforce one another. I mean, the UAT can be a great way to to learn the system as you're going through UAT. But to your point too, Nikki, it's a great way to poke holes in and perfect and fine tune the training materials so that you can refine that yeah. and make it ready for prime time to roll out to the broader the, the broader audience. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when we typically scope um, ERP programs, um, we'll also utilize UAT because we want the client to be spending their training budget in the most efficient and best way that they can. So if you've only got two people managing fixed assets in a shared service center, get them involved in UAT, get them on board early. And there's your on-the-job training. You don't need to develop a full um, classroom or informal structured session if you've already got them involved at that early stage. Right, right. No, it's really well said. I'd love to hear from the audience too, you know, what, what have you seen work in training uh, deployments in terms of, you know, what have you seen work or fail? You know, what have you seen to be a, a big sticking point in your experience, either a, if you're going through a transformation now, or if you've been through one in the past, I'd love to hear the audience's feedback on what they've seen work or cause failure when it comes to, to training and adoption. Um, here's a couple of other comments I'll share with you all. And, and I'm going to turn to a question here too, from the audience. Uh, but this is from Videng on LinkedIn or Videng. I'm not sure. I may be, I'm probably enunciating that incorrectly and I apologize for that. Um, but I feel training is more important and the interest of the employees is also its key point. So um, great point there from, from LinkedIn. And then here's a question. It's a little bit of longer question. I'm going to see if I can show it on the screen and I'll read the part that gets cut off here. Um, this is from Laik on LinkedIn. Laik says, as much as we all thinking about as much as we all think and talk about systems, I really think that the main driver of failing is uninterested people. Why? I think communication is the key. If you clearly communicate and keep it open from the start, even before you start, that gives your employees confidence and insight and ownership. Very important to keep the communication going. So I guess that it, maybe I'll turn that into a question. When you think about employee communications and employee training, obviously there's a lot of overlap and similarities and, and they're both very important sub work streams within change management. How does training and communication typically tie together? How do you see them intersect or reinforce one another? Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Communication is key. Um, and with the training program, we typically try to work very closely with any communication work stream that there is. Um, and the comms need to be drip fed, not too much because they'll be inundated, but they need to be kept informed. And there's a really fine line. And we've come across um, a number of different communication outfits or approaches that have done just that and done a, a really good job. But I suppose the other thing, um, coming back to the point about uninterested people, you're right. In fairness, some people will say, I cannot believe this, but they will say IT is too dry a subject, ERP, too dry a subject. And the key thing with training is we need to sell it to our audiences. And I don't mean, um, you know, bra our skirts and running into the classroom and being super, super excited, but we need to sell the training solution or the ERP solution so that it shows our end user that it's going to make them more efficient. It's going to make their jobs easier. So many of our users trained in a new ERP system are so admin and transactional heavy that they're losing the, the key part of their role, which could be supplier or customer facing or buyer facing because they're so bogged down with administration. And if the training solution can show how it's going to make their lives better, easier, and also more profitable for the business, that's all for the good. And hopefully it keeps those people interested. But yeah, that's a very valid point. Uninterested people make for very poor delegates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'd argue too that I'd, I'd maybe challenge the assumption that this is an ERP implementation, whatever whatever this is to you as an organization. I think one of the first mistakes is to think of it as an ERP implementation, and it's really not. I mean, you are deploying a new tool, yes, of course, but there are broader business process changes and broader organizational impacts and changes that you're enabling with that technology. And I think that's maybe part of the problem is you're viewing this as ERP training, and really it's it's not ERP yeah. training, it's business training, it's process training, organizational training, job role training, all that stuff. Absolutely. And if you can link those benefits, not only to the business, because there might be, you know, that opinion, those in glass um, towers, all of the benefits are for the management. Actually, what we try to do is when training is introduce those benefits to you as the end user. How is it going to make your life easier? How are you going to make this process more streamlined? How are you going to be more profitable? So it really is important that we take on board what the end user um, is doing in their day role, but also make it a, a positive experience for them. Um, because yeah, it's very difficult to get them interested because they do perceive it as IT or just an ERP system. It's more than that. Right, absolutely. Here's a comment from um, Satish on LinkedIn. Satish says training and quality TM is super critical to make any ERP successful. So Satish totally agrees. Point. Yeah, mm -hmm. great point there. Um, training material, another question here from uh, Satish again, training material should be uh, created before 
uh, UAT to conduct that UAT. So sure. agree with you on that point too. Yeah, yeah. And again, it does depend on um, where you're at with your UAT cycle. If it's relatively early, there's only so much that the materials can do. So what we do is typically work very closely with the UAT teams and almost strip the, those materials based on each weekly cycle. So we know we've actually got the, the right materials ready to, to test in that environment. But also make sure you leave some um, contingency or a percentage of your training development days to finalise and update those materials once all of the outputs of UAT are known. Right. Right. Now, here's a good question that sort of brings us upstream a little bit in a, in a transformation project. And this is from Kyler on LinkedIn. Kyler says, in my experience, the most critical aspect of user adoption training is the assessment. Conducting a needs assessment to determine the specific training needs of employees can help ensure that the training is targeted and relevant. So what are your thoughts on, you know, maybe shifting that into a question? What do you do up front in a project? Let's just say we're in a nowhere close to UAT yet. We're still you know, in the design or build phase of a, of a project. What yeah. what should we be thinking about or doing from a training perspective if we haven't already? Yeah, so um, I think that that point is absolutely key because we work very closely with organizations that have started their training needs analysis. So they've identified their, their, their current world and also what the new world would look like. But it's typically a huge spreadsheet with thousands and thousands of lines and there's no human element to it. We need to create um, a training program off the back of that. So with regards to your training needs analysis, it does take quite a while. Um, we found that um, some internal training managers have tried to do that themselves. Um, other organizations have worked far better by creating um, a format, an information gathering format, normally in Excel, that can be sent out to the businesses and completed in record time with more factual and correct information coming back. One thing I would say is some TNAs have actually utilized login information, access information from previous legacy systems. That just doesn't work. You have people out there that we don't know are sharing IDs and some may be staying logged on for goodness knows how long. So it's really um, unreliable, depending on how old your legacy system is, to rely on those types of stats. So I would definitely go out to the business but make sure you've got an information capture tool that's easy to use. Um, and then as a result of that, that can form the foundation of your end user training program or plan. Right. Yeah. Makes, makes total sense. So in other words, we should not wait until it's almost time for training to then just start training no. the trainers. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. You need to start thinking about it because you need to start thinking about your audiences and let's not forget if we've got a, um, a TOM or a target operating model running alongside this and your roles and your departments are going to be changing, you should be ever thinking about how you're going to be grouping those users. And so sometimes it's not until um, somebody else on board and starts asking these types of questions where people literally do sit back and think, good question, didn't think of that. But the good thing is, is if you do your scoping early enough, it means you can start molding those different um, user groups as well. So everybody's going to get the right training. Right. Right. Very interesting. So this is a, a, a comment that I'll turn into a question as well. This is from LinkedIn. I apologize. I don't see the name of the person that asked this question, but the question is, or the comment is quick reference guides and navigation maps are critical. Teaching users how to access information is more important than flooding them with details. The earlier the user can build confidence with the new system, the better. So with yeah. this comment in mind, what, what should we be training about? What, what should we be thinking about? as it relates to training that goes beyond the classroom. Cause I think a lot of times we think about, we're going to train the trainers, the trainers are going to go into a classroom and teach everyone how to use the system and do the new processes. But what else, what yeah. other sort of training and adoption tools and tactics should we be thinking about? Yeah, there's a few of them up to name, name a couple. For example, um, audiences learn in different styles. You talked about the traditional classroom, train the trainer, classroom delivery. That is not going to cut it for a warehouse operative or a production line operative right, or a driver. So what you need to do is you need to be thinking about different ways of training these audiences. And to come back to the LinkedIn comment about making materials available early, it's really important for early engagement especially if in your warehouse, in your factory, in your production outlets, you are changing your hardware and changing your software. You're introducing touchscreen kiosk screens. All of this is stuff that those type of white collar workers need to touch and they need to play with. Now, this is before um, actual structured training, but you can have engagement sessions, almost roadshows. I'm sure some of you already got these planned, but show the audience what they're going to be expected to use. Take the fear factor away so that when you do start to deliver informal, small sessions, 
slightly off the factory floor because these guys don't like to be taken into a classroom. They've already seen what that hardware looks like and what that software looks like. So I suppose what I would say is um, there's certain types of learning for certain types of users. If you have field, field based engineers or, or salespeople that typically do not want to be in the office because they're not earning, they like to be out on the road, they might actually produce more of a self learn approach or an e learning approach. So it's just in time, it's still interactive, but they don't need to put something in their diary that they're probably going to cancel anyway. So, um, depending on your user group, the amount of time they have available, and the complexity of the subject that's going to govern the type of training deliverable and the medium that you use. So again, one size does not fit all. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And it sort of maybe a, a flip side to that question or looking at the other uh, side of the, the question in terms of, you mentioned earlier, Nikki, that one of the challenges if you don't do training and adoption well, is that you'll have an extended hypercare process and an extended stabilization yeah. period of just getting the product in the, in the processes to be stable to where you can just continue your operations. Forget about real business value. This is just keep us out of a true disaster if, if by extending that hyper hyper care. So what should we, you know, having with that sort of challenge in mind or that common pitfall in mind, what, what should we expect in terms of sort of pre go live training and post go live training? Like how do you, how do you typically address that? Or what, what are your thoughts on that and on how, what to expect in those two phases yeah. of training? So, so this is why I favor the train the trainer model or that collaborative ex, um, approach with us and our clients. Um, when they do say that they just don't have the resource to do any of the delivery and they want to, us to do it for them or they give it to contractors, um, we will move on and the contractors will move on. But if you've got that um, expertise in house, it means that you've got your business as usual and your induction training readiness. But what a lot of our clients do, um, I'll give you a perfect example. If we're training a finance audience, a group of accountants, um, they'll say when we're working out what training program to deliver, right, so these guys post journals, you know, single, uh, multiple line volume, they do various different types of um, reporting, they do month end, they do year end. And immediately I'll stop them and I'll say, normally you go live at the start of your fiscal year. So it is pointless training somebody 11 months too early on how to do a year end. And there's lots of different instances where there might be some quarterly processes or processes that are not necessarily required from day one. So some clients have adopted approach where they do a just-in-time training program. Um, all of our users start working on ERP and there might be some super users or specialists that are churning out those specialist orders, whatever they might be. And then you have your second round of training. Once the system's fed it in, people are calmer, they're ready to embrace new functionality, and it's that new functionality that wasn't necessarily needed from day one. So again, one size doesn't fit all, so you could approach it very differently and only just, and only give just-in-time training prior to go live. But there should be a mechanism whereby you've got a training program following go live for sure. Right, yeah, that's really well said, and, and I love the prioritization of processes, you know, the things that you don't necessarily need to cram in, into the pre go live training. It's not going to, it has absolutely zero value at that moment in time. In fact, it, it, it's just a waste of time and money at that point, because you're going to have to retrain them later anyway, because things will change. People will forget what you taught them 11 months ago. So I think that's a great point. So make sure you're training them on the right things at the right time. Exactly. Yeah. Here's a, here's a really good question that I'm really excited to ask you guys. Um, where is it? So this is a, I feel like this is one of those questions where a lot of people that hear this question are probably going to have a sinking feeling and say, uh oh, to themselves, because they're going to realize this is happening on their project, because it happens all the time. And this is from Laik on LinkedIn. And Laik says, I have a question to ask, how do you align your training schedule with your clients and SI timeline, an SI is system integrator, technical implementer, technical consultant, you know, it's a semi interchangeable term. Um, sometimes I feel as though you as trainers and SIs are responsible for timeline. Uh, would be going for conflicting goals. So let me rephrase that. So sometimes the, the trainers and the training needs are going to conflict with what the timeline is that the SI or the system integrator has put out there. So how do you how do you reconcile that? I imagine you've probably seen that yeah. times. <laughs> That's a brilliant question. And normally we're um, not necessarily at fisticuffs, but we do have SIs that need um, and de demand the need of uh, their SMEs or super user time. And we also have that same requirement as well. So there's a, a number of different ways of approaching it. Now, please don't roll your eyes. I'm glad I can't see anybody watching this podcast. But my, one of the things I was going to say is think about your project as a stage production. 
every lead actor has an understudy. And every single project I've been on, bar one or two, and I've been in the game for quite a long time, never has enough resource. And as you get closer and closer to go live, those poor subject matter experts or super users are pulled in every direction. Data cleansing, scripting, training, meetings with SIs, meeting with people like us. There just isn't enough of them to go around. So if you have got the potential, you're just pulling together the structure of your project team, think under studies if you can. With regards to the SIs and um, vying for the same amount of time, what we've typically done on some projects is we've actually had both the SI and the super user in the room at the same time, because sometimes the SI is going to give us the um, technical information or the functional how-to, and other times uh, the SME will only know that business content. And when you have that disconnect, it's really important to join those two up. With regards to vying for their time, again, it's just about being fair and having done it multiple times before, we take a lot less to develop content because we have templates and so on, and we just have that experience. But nevertheless, it is a true challenge on your project when the SI is vying for you know the same resources as we are and you are. But it's also about flexibility, right, with the resources. So we do have to plan our training timeline against the, the clients or the SI's training timeline, and that can change. Mm. The goal life can move, the window between UAT and goal life can shrink or expand. So you need a training partner or trainers that are flexible, that can offboard and reboard um, to align with that SI timeline. Right, yeah, that makes makes total sense. And it it also, I think, raises the question or the thought in my mind that it's how important it is to not get so myopically focused on just building the software that you totally forget about training. And I think one of the interesting human dynamics that, that I see in the projects like these that are just truly fascinating to me is that we as humans can see and touch the software. And it's like we get so fixated on let's just put all of our time and effort in making sure the software quote unquote works. And then we'll get to the training when we get to it. You know, it's almost like th that part doesn't matter be unless we can get the software to work. And so there's part of me that thinks, well, do you really need as much software to work then? Do you need to deploy as much software if you're not doing the training well? Maybe you cut back the scope of the technology and but really double down on the training and do that really, really well. And yet yeah. maybe you haven't deployed all the cool bells and whistles you want, but at least you've deployed what you did deploy. You deploy it really well. People are using it well. You've mitigated risk and all that stuff. Is that a sort of painful or... Um, a conflicted discussion you often have with your clients as far as maybe it's time to think think about where you rededicate or focus your efforts? Yeah, very much so. And, and it's, it depends on who you've got that's working on a particular work stream because they might just be typically technically minded. And then you'll come along, I will come along and say, so why does the end user need to do this? Oh, because of X, Y, Z. But if they just did this one process or tick this one box, that's doing the same thing right, but it's not overcomplicating it. And I'm not talking about dumbing down the training, but it's really important that, as you say, with all bells and whistles, they can come later with, with subsequent phases. It's really important to bed in solid processes that are not trying to do everything from the first go live. It might be go live two or three, it might be in waves, but it is really important to bed in just those solid processes. We do find projects delay because they've been far too ambitious and they've tried to go live with too much in the short period of time that they've got. Right. Yeah. Mm. Very, very true. That's a, that's a interesting dynamic. And back to the point about when you don't invest in training and employee adoption, or you don't invest in it well, the cost that you might've saved by not investing in adoption training is exponentially outweighed by the risk and the disruption that you cause to your business. And I think that's something that organizations have a lot of trouble seeing and trying to quantify, which is, yes, I might have to spend more time and money on training and adoption, but it's going to save me X amount of time and money because I'm not going to have a disaster on my hands operationally once I once I do go live. And it's, it's so hard for organizations, especially executives, to, to really get their heads around that. It is. It's those hidden costs that you sort of can't quantify early on. Um, and we get asked that a lot about, you know, what is it going to cost? What What is the cost of training? And when it's really early on, it's kind of sometimes difficult to cost it up front. But we can give an indicative, you know, indication of what it might cost. Um, but I think a rule of thumb that we can give is to consider around 10% of the overall consultancy days that you've bought with your SI or your partner to dedicate to bespoke end user training program. 
that's just a rough kind of rule of thumb if people are sitting here about to embark on an ERP implementation you can sort of calculate that as what your investment should be on uh, professional training right and that's a great point I mean it, you know we can quantify that number and say I was planning on a ten million dollar U.S. dollar implementation, so now it's going to be eleven. So let's just say I'm going to I'm going to spend a million dollars or ten percent uh, on the on the training and adoption. So then I think, well, what? Okay, that's that's a million dollars. I I could theoretically save a million dollars by not doing that. But what would that cost on the flip side? Like, I think it's important to ask the what if questions of what if I can't ship product for a month? What what does that cost me? And a lot of times when you look at those costs of like. I can't ship product. I can't run payroll. Can't close the books. You know what? What does that cost you? And you almost look at it as a sort of insurance policy. Like if I spend a million dollars on training and adoption, I'm not 100 percent eliminating the risk, but I am significantly mitigating the risk of having potentially 10 or 20 times that cost of disruption post go live. And a lot of organizations don't connect those dots or, or try to quantify it. But I think it's important to to do that for sure. Um. Here's an interesting uh, question from from uh, Gus on, on LinkedIn. He says, train the trainer sometimes loses credibility as people come and go. I would record all workshops and use this for knowledge transfer. And I think that's a great point, not only for people that come and go, but also so many organizations that are going through transformations and ERP implementations are doing so in the context of either existing or planned merger and acquisition activity. So if you're going to go acquire companies in the future, or merge, you, you have that this this becomes collateral and and um, knowledge capital that you can use to make those future M&A activities much more yeah, effective. absolutely that is a good shout as well and also when you're developing training programs i think we spoke about it um, a little earlier um, to avoid any type of dilution and um, to avoid those workarounds if you've got those scripted training plans as well it ensures that the best practice messages and the correct usage of the system is being enforced when training is being delivered post go live which is really important right yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess just to maybe bring this all for, full circle and sort of put a bow on this the entire thread of, of employee adoption and training, um, what recommendations would you give to an organization that are perhaps, perhaps they're early in their digital transformation, perhaps they're just evaluating potential ERP systems, or maybe they've just selected their ERP system and they're getting ready to start design and they're headed into their implementation. What sort of, uh, what sort of recommendations would you make or give to organizations that are about to get started on a transformation? How, what should they be thinking about and doing from an employee adoption and training perspective? Sure, I think for me, number one is careful planning and do it early. Consider and understand all of your training options. Um, don't assume that your partner or your SI is gonna handle all of the training. You know, scratch away at the contract or ask the partner, you know, what is the detail and do that early on. Um, the second one is don't assume that using contract trainers will be a cheaper option. They vary in quality um, and the documentation they produce can sometimes lack consistently because they all use different methodologies. Um, and also my, my most point that I hammer into every client I talk to, and it's a really expensive mistake that we see far too often, don't onboard contract trainers too early. We see contract trainers onboarded a year before go live. Um, and they're sort of getting embedded in the project and understanding what the constraints are and the processes, that there's a timeline that you should follow with training. Training should start to be developed just before UAT or around the testing time. You don't need to onboard them a year before going live. And it's a really expensive mistake that we get called into sometimes to clean up afterwards. And I think that comes from, and we always use this analogy that sometimes the partners will say, well, we're taking nine months to build this system for you, to build this machine. You can't get a trainer to come in two months before go live and understand it all. But in fact, the professional ERP trainers can because we are teaching the end users how to drive the car, not lift the bonnet up and, and fix the engine. And I think that's a perception that's sort of drip fed down to many organizations from certain partners and SIs. So don't onboard the contract trainers or trainers too early. Right. That's... That's a great point. And then what happens too, if you do do that or make that mistake that you mentioned, Joanne, is that you train people too early or you train the, the you bring on the contractors and onboard them too early. And then people start to lose confidence in the overall 
tra- training and change management initiative. They start thinking, oh, this is just a waste of time and money because they're not, you know, because you did it wrong. Yeah. You're spending this time and money and, and you're not doing it right. And so then people start to question the overall work stream or the threat or the importance of it. Sure. There's that, but then there's also the cost of having to rework all the materials because things yeah. are changing throughout that year. Every testing phase, SIT, UAT, things are going to change. So they are just constantly reworking materials. Whereas if you bring the trainers in at the right time, when you're nearly ready and it's very stable, then that's when you start developing all of those training documentations, which is going to feed into the training that's delivered to the end users. Right. Well, great. Well, this is a, a really great topic. I could spend easily another hour. I know you're both not available for another hour. Otherwise, I totally would do it. Uh, but but. But thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you being here to talk about this. Maybe tell us a little bit more, Joanne, just how can we learn more about Optimum and Onboard ERP? Sure. Yeah. So you can go to our website, optimum.co.uk. Um, and then we have our new baby that's been born, which is onboardserp.com. And there's a whole host of case studies there. And also our contact details are on there. So if you wanted to reach out to myself or Nikki, then we'd happily have that conversation to work out you know, an indicative training solution for you, talk about all these things that you need to think about. And of course, the important part is to cost it up for you. Perfect. Well, great. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you to the audience for the great questions. We appreciate it and uh, love this topic. We'll have to have you guys back on to talk more about this because I feel like we could spend hours talking about it. So (laughs) thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I hope everyone has a great day. You can find uh, this live stream every week, same time, same place. We do the same live stream with different topics related to digital transformation. And then this discussion we had here today will become part of the weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast that gets released a week from tomorrow on Wednesday of next week. So be sure to check that out. If you don't subscribe to that podcast, you can find that on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So uh, thank you both for being here. Thank you to the audience. Hope you all have a great day, a great week, and we'll see you next time on our live stream. Take care, everyone. Thank you.